Hello, and welcome to a Teentober celebration with author E. Lockhart, brought to you by the Children's and Teen Services Department here at Baker and Taylor. My name is Bobby Benzer, joining you from that team, Cats, and it is my absolute honor to be sitting down today with the amazingly talented E. Lockhart, one of my favorite writers and a favorite among many of you watching from your home or at the public library in your neighborhood. Um, all as an ode to teen literacy and teen needs this October, this Teentober. Yeah, I hope everyone joining in from home or at the library is having a lovely fall and is ready to hunker down for an hour of good conversation and fun and a reading from E. Lockhart. If you have a question, please leave it in the Q&A area. We've actually taken some questions beforehand that we're going to address, but we'll try to get to everyone. And I'm also happy to say that E. Lockhart has offered to come back for another session in a few hours at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific time to do this once more for those who cannot make the earlier session. And we'll be covering um, more questions then. So I'd like to begin with a formal introduction. E. Lockhart, um, is an American writer of children's picture books, young adult novels, and adult fiction. She is known best for the Ruby Oliver Quartet, which begins with The Boyfriend List, The Disreputable History of Frankie Lando Banks, a Michael L. Prince Award honor, and her New York Times bestseller, We Were Liars. Her more recent work includes the thriller Genuine Fraud, though what I like to call speculative realistic fiction, again, again, and um, her, her newest work is a graphic novel, the newest superhero in Gotham City, um, it, the, that is called Whistle. Today we hope to touch on the breadth of her writing portfolio, but are gonna focus on genuine fraud because who doesn't love a good thriller? And there's so, so much to talk about um, in, that, in this book. So Ms. Lockhart, welcome. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Let's get started. Can you, in your own words, describe the premise of genuine fraud? I fear that I will give away too many spoilers if I do it myself. Sure. It is a con artist story about two young women who look enough alike to share a passport. And it goes backwards. <laughs> that is a great way. And um, one of, I was immediately drawn to it because um, one of the main characters name is Imogen and that is my daughter's name. And I was like, whoa, that is cool. I've, I've never seen that before. Um, and of course we're introduced to another uh, really cool fierce character named Jewel. Again, I'm not gonna give away too much. You're gonna read a little bit from this in a, in a little bit. Um, but you mentioned just now that it's written backwards. You are the master of story structure. Uh, every book you write does things a little bit differently. In Jewel, the character I just mentioned, we don't necessarily have a unreliable narrator, but we have one that intentionally lies or, or the narrator intentionally um, leaves details out, lies by omission, say, um, to move the story along. It's written in reverse, counting down chapters till you get to chapter one, and you play a lot with perspective. Um, Throughout the course of the book, we see a narrator that's more omniscient, you know, one that's a little bit closer to Jewel, and one that um, even speaks in a second person point of view where the narrator's literally talking to the reader with that you uh, verbiage. Um, in hindsight, that seems to work best for the story. Can you talk a little bit about this choice, how you came to it and why, and did you write it in the order that it renders on page? Well, I started out wanting to write a story that went backwards. And I think one of my flaws as a writer is that I can get very interested in showing off, uh, you know, uh, and, and I can lose track of the, the heart of something or the poetry of something in, in my, desire to do backflips or whatever. And so it started with the desire to do backflips, which is, you know, to tell a story in reverse chronological order. Uh, and 
I had been thinking about that for a while, but I couldn't figure out what kind of story would be the better for it. Do you know what I'm saying? I think it's hard to find a story that is better told backwards than forwards. And when I thought of the, you know, the origin story of a con artist and a, a journey from, you know, harsh experience and guilt and all of that back to innocence um, and getting to that you would get to know this, you know, there'd be this intriguing sort of badass character and then you would peel a lay, away layer by layer by layer by going backwards into her origin story. That seemed like something that that would in fact benefit from going backwards. And so um, that is what I wanted to do. And I, um, after I thought of that, I thought about uh, the Talents of Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith, which really served as a mentor text for genuine fraud. And um, Highsmith is, you know, she wrote Strangers on a Train and Talent of Mr. Ripley, which are her two most famous novels, but she wrote many, many other novels and is a master of a kind of suspense novel that really takes you kind of deep into the the criminal mind and is very um, disturbing because of course the criminal mind is just a human mind right and you see those connections between yourself and these characters um, who do some terrible things and uh, I had read Ripley many times and I reread it again before writing Genuine Fraud and I used I would say the some of the story architecture that Highsmith uses, but in reverse. And um, at the start of the town to Mr. Ripley, Ripley um, is invited kind of to go and handle a, a, he's a young man, he gets invited by a stranger to go and chase down a the man's son who is up to no good in, in Italy and won't come home. And um, Ripley takes this journey on and Ripley is reading Henry James's The Ambassadors, which is about a middle-aged man who goes across to Europe to bring back a ne'er-do-well. Um, so there's a kind of story model um, which Highsmith was really conscious of in which somebody is sent to retrieve a, a difficult person of one type or another right I mean this is this is true of heart of darkness also you know um but in the retrieving of this ne'er-do-well character uh the protagonist is irrevocably changed and uh and the pull and the power of the ne'er-do-well character is immense and so I had read the ambassadors as well. And I was intrigued to see that Highsmith knew where her debt lay and my debt lies to Highsmith in turn. Um, so I had a story architecture that I thought I could bring a lot of my own interests and my own themes to. Um, I reversed it, I made it contemporary, I made it all women. Highsmith stories about men. Um, and then I began to shape the story so it would work the best backwards, which meant changing many pieces of the story architecture while still having that debt to Highsmith. So um, I structured it out and then I wrote it from back to front so that it I was writing in chronological order so that I could follow the motivations of my character in the best possible way. Um, and then after that, I revised it going the normal way, the way that readers would experience the book. So I basically wrote it in both directions. Got it. Got it. That is really cool because you definitely understand. Well, there so, so many things to pick up there. I really wish that um, you teach too, or the last time we spoke. I yeah, I would love to. I think we would all love to sit down for one of your writing classes classes sometime um but we'll, we'll stick with with genuine fraud for a second so really interesting that the talented mr ripley um 
was a motivation. Of course, you know, many of us have seen that film. There's an obvious cinematic quality to this to this book. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, that character, the literature that informed their their motivations in their life. And we're introduced to a lot of greats in this book through the character of, of Imogen and later Jewel, you know, Dickens that informed kind of their motivations. So that's all very interesting. And I think one of the reasons for me as the reader, it worked reading it backwards was because your loyalties to each person changes. So um, as you're as you're reading it along, at least for me, it did um, the person I was rooting for. And so the theme of the anti-hero comes up a lot throughout this this book. Um, themes of um, identity, jealousy, privilege, all things that um, for me, a lot of your writing, but I think that it was kind of um, shown in a very different way through that smart choice of, of writing it backwards. So, and, I, and um, because of that whole idea of the origin story and you as the reader, you're guessing like, well, why, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And as you go backwards, you, you feel a little differently about that character because you're moving back to front. So um, I'm sure a lot of us are very pleased to, to learn the motivation there. And I think it might, it might um, benefit from hearing a little bit of the story now and um, we'll get an even bigger taste of that. So I'm gonna turn things over to you. Okay, um, I'm gonna share my screen and read to you at the same time. So here we go. So the images that I'm putting on the screen basically go with genuine fraud. And there are three types of images. The first are a set of promotional images that Penguin Random House made for me at the launch of the book. The second are a series of Instagram images that I made together with my uh, photographer friend, Heather Weston. And we um, just made them as a kind of creative project that we both enjoyed that I then used, you know, on Instagram when the book was coming out and my British publisher used them a lot and made like beautiful postcards out of them. And I think it can be interesting for people to see, you know, kind of the official publisher created images and then basically the author created images and notice, you know, different themes that we chose to pull out and different ways we chose to portray the same content. And then the last series of images are images from my Pinterest board, because I, uh, like many people in my demographic, love a little Pinterest. And um, I collected images as I was working on the book um, that felt to me thematically relevant. Some of them are specific locations that um, appear in genuine fraud and others are just like thematic uh, imagery. So I think those should be fun, especially if you have read the book, but even if you haven't yet read it, you will get the vibe um, in several different ways from these images. Um, so the section I'm reading is early in the story and basically you've met a young woman named Jewel who is living at a hotel, um, a fancy resort hotel in, um, in Cabo. And she's been living there for a while on her own. She's only 18 years old and you don't know why. And she has a conversation with a bartender and she has a conversation with another woman in the gym. And basically, after she has a conversation with a woman in the gym, she goes on the run and she asks the bartender to help her. And he says yes. And he says, you can go out the staff entrance into the staff parking lot and hide in the bottom of my car. So she does that. She has her suitcase with her and she you don't really know what what she's running running from or why you just know that this conversation with the woman in the gym probably sparked it and she eventually he comes out and he drives her into the town and uh, of uh, San Jose del Cabo in Mexico about an hour or so outside of the resort area and this is what happens next Donovan stopped and opened the driver's side door 
The light came on inside the car. Where are we? Jewel asked. It was dark outside. San Jose del Cabo. This where you live? Not too close. Jewel was relieved, but it seemed very blackout. Shouldn't there be street lights and businesses lit up for tourist crowds? Anywhere nearby, she asked. I parked in an alley so you wouldn't be seen getting out of my car. Jewel crawled out. Her muscles were stiff and her face felt coated in grease. The alley was lined with garbage bins. There was light only from a couple of second story windows. Thanks for the ride. Pop the trunk, will you? You said $100 American when I got you to town. Of course. Jewel took her wallet from her back pocket and paid. But now it's more, Donovan added. What? 300 more. I thought we were friends. He took a step toward her. I make you drinks because it's my job. I pretend to like talking to you because that's my job too. You think I don't see how you look down on me? Second best Hulk, what kind of scotch? We are not friends, Miss Williams. You're draw lying to me half the time and I'm lying to you all of the time. She could smell liquor spilled on his shirt. His breath was hot in her face. Jewel had honestly believed he liked her. They had shared jokes and he'd given her free potato chips. Wow, she said quietly. Another 300, he said. Was he a small time hustler jacking a girl who was carrying a lot of American dollars? Or was he a sleazeball who thought she'd rub up against him rather than give him the extra 300? Could Noah have paid him off? Jill tucked her wallet back in her pocket. She shifted the strap so her bag went across her chest. Donovan? She stepped forward, close. She looked up at him with big eyes. Then she brought her right forearm up hard, snapped his head back and punched him in the groin. He doubled over. Jewel grabbed his slick hair and yanked his head back. She twisted him around, forcing him off balance. He jabbed with one elbow, slamming Jewel in the chest. It hurt, but the second thrust of the elbow missed as she sidestepped, grabbed that elbow and twisted it behind Donovan's back. His arm was soft, repulsive. She held on tight and with her free hand snatched her money out of his greedy fingers. She shoved the cash into her jeans pocket and jerked Donovan's elbow hard while she tapped his hip pockets looking for his phone. Not there. Back pocket then. She found it and shoved the phone down her bra for lack of anywhere else. Now he couldn't call Noah with her location, but he still had the car keys in his left hand. Donovan kicked out, hitting her in the shin. Jewel punched him in the side of the neck and he crumpled forward. One hard shove and Donovan hit the ground. He started to push himself up, but Jewel grabbed a metal lid from one of the nearby trash cans and banged it on his head twice. And he collapsed on a pile of garbage bags, bleeding from the forehead and one eye. Jewel backed out of his reach. She held the lid. Drop your keys. Moaning, Donovan extended his left hand and tossed them so they landed a couple inches from his body. Jewel grabbed the keys and popped the trunk. Then she took her rolling suitcase and sprinted down the street before Donovan could stand up. She slowed to a walk as soon as she hit the main road in San Jose del Cabo and checked her shirt. It looked clean enough. She wiped her hands slowly and calmly over her face in case there was anything on it, dirt, spit, or blood. She pulled a compact out of her bag and checked herself as she moved, using the mirror to look over her shoulder. There was no one behind her. She put on matte pink lipstick, snapped her compact shut, and slowed her pace even more. She couldn't look like she was running from anything. The air was warm and music thumped from inside the bars. Tourists milled around in front of many of them, white, black, and Mexican, all drunk and loud. Cheap vacation crowds. Jewel tossed Donovan's keys and phone in a trash can. She looked for a cab or a supercabos, bus, but didn't see either. Okay then. She needed to hide and change in case Donovan came after her. He would pursue her if he was working for Noah or if he wanted revenge. Picture yourself now on film. Shadows flit across your smooth skin as you walk. There are bruises forming underneath your clothes, but your hair looks excellent. You're armed with gadgets, thin shards of metal that perform outrageous feats of technology and assault. You carry poisonous poisons and antidotes. You are the center of the story. You and no one else. You've got that interesting origin tale, that unusual education. Now you're ruthless, you're brilliant, you're practically fearless. There's a body count behind you because you do whatever's required to stay alive. But it's a day's work, that's all. 
He looks superb in the light from the Mexican bar windows. After a fight, your cheeks are flushed and oh, your clothes are so very flattering. Yes, it's true that you are criminally violent, brutal even, but that's your job and you're uniquely qualified. So it's sexy. Jewel watched a shit ton of movies. She knew that women were rarely the centers of such stories. Instead, they were eye candy, arm candy, victims, or love interests. Mostly they existed to help the great white hetero hero on his fucking epic journey. When there was a heroine, she weighed very little, wore very little, and had had her teeth fixed. Jewel knew she didn't look like those women. She would never look like those women, but she was everything those heroes were. And in some ways she was more. She knew that too. Thank you. That was, sorry, I got entranced. So I, <laughs> um, that was so awesome. And I'm glad that you picked, I mean, not only was that like a heart pounder of a scene, but um, it kind of feeds in really well to my next question. And that's about gender roles and expectations. Um, and something I'd love for you to explore more because I feel like it's a common thread in a lot of your writing, these fierce, confident, unapologetic characters. Um, can you explore that a little bit more? And how do you get ahead of Teen Girls so well? <laughs> well, Genuine Fraud is the first book that I had written where there were like action sequences and battles. Whistle, a new Gotham City hero, the, the graphic novel that just came out, that has has that too. But uh, that was new territory for me. And, you know, I think it was like, it's very deep in my soul as a just person in a female body. I, you know, I was a very small child, like shortest kid in the class, you know, for a long time and I always felt very uh physically powerless and um I didn't have any uh role models of of uh female bodies that were physically powerful um except in comics and those bodies were awesome but very idealized and sexualized at the same time as they were um powerful um, and of course, they were only a small percentage of the bodies that were in the comics. Um, you know, Wonder Woman and, uh, you know, uh, what's her name from the Fantastic Four and, uh, you know, some things like this, characters like that. Um, so I really wrote, I think, you know, something of a a character who comes out of like my own feelings of of rage you know rage is like a really difficult emotion to talk about and I think a lot of people feel it and it is one of the really most shameful emotions that we have in our society um there's very few you know acceptable ways to express rage and young women in particular in our culture um because certain kinds of aggressive sports and uh, violent video games and things like that are so gendered, they feel closed off from those outlets for those kinds of feelings, they turn them in on themselves, right? So, you know, um, uh, self-harm and um, body dysmorphia and, and eating disorders and all of this there's many, many explanations for them, but among those, we might count um, rage with nowhere to go, right? A very, a very unacceptable emotion for a feminine person, right? It's very uh, more unacceptable as for females than for than for men who are expected to be masculine and full of stuff, much right? Beyond, right? Uh, so, you know, hopefully, we're moving beyond some of this in our culture, and then that is a wonderful positive development, but. It's certainly part of my own growing up to not know what to do with rageful feelings. And I wanted to write from that that place and try to write honestly about somebody whose, you know, rage is both her greatest power and her greatest downfall. That's awesome. I mean, you see that with the character Imogen too, because she 
Bray Austin tries to be the person other people want her to be in her femininity and coolness. But then there's these um, bouts of just rage that, you know, her, her um, demeanor changes so quickly, I felt. Um, and I think maybe I'm noticing that because I actually got to, I read the audio version of it or listened to the audio version. Oh yeah, Rebecca Solaire is wonderful. Very talented, very talented. Um, well, thank you for that. This, um, you know, you talked a little bit about your origin story there. And um, I guess that kind of feeds into the next question. And I wanna kind of lead into that by saying that you have a Twitter presence. I love following you on there. And you recently talked about um, a New York Times article, um, <laughs> Art Friend, yeah, that uh, I read because you called it out and it, which also was amazing. And really what it's about is as a writer, you know, motivations and borrowing from your life, but other people's life and, and maybe not even realizing you're borrowing um, uh, for ex from experiences, not even realizing sometimes that it's influencing your work. Um, were you aware that, that your rage was feeling this? And um, do, you, do you wanna talk a little bit about that article? And do you wanna talk a little bit about how you use inspiration from others or your everyday or even your own life in not only this but all your other books i'm sure we'd love to hear a little bit about um, whistle and also um Amber liars and and all that, that good stuff right well um for those of you who don't know the the new york times article is called the bad art friend if you want to google it or who is the bad art friend and it's basically about two uh women both writers one of whom borrowed some details from the other one's life um, and put them in a story. It's got a lot more complicated and messy than that. Um, and it is really fascinating. And one thing um, the author uh, Lauren Groff said when interviewed for that article, which was not about her, but she knew some of the people in it was, oh, well, every person I ever meet, I tie them upside down by their ankles and shake them to everything, all their secrets come out of their pockets. And then I collect the secrets and and then take them for myself. And that's how she described her writing process. And I, I'm not sure what I think about the Bad Art Friend article. It's so, so, so deep and complicated that uh, I could argue myself, you know, into siding with either party in one way or another. But that Groff quote really stuck with me. And uh, I do think that there is a sense in which that is what, what writers do. Um, we take our own, you know, mixed up complicated emotional selves and we try to put that on the paper. Um, and that includes other people's stories that have come into our, you know, taken up residency in our psyche and, and made it that we keep thinking about or keep wondering about. And um, I grew up a scholarship kid in a lot of fancy private schools. Um, and I, my mother comes from a very waspy, um, New England family, and my dad uh, is a Jewish New Yorker. Um, they were divorced very young. My I grew up with my mom in this kind of communal housing, uh, like communes, basically, um, up until I was 10. And then we mostly lived like in a house with another family, but those other families changed. So it was a very, uh, it wasn't a whole commune, but it was like shared housing with usually another single mom and her kid. So Then I went to these very fancy private schools and most of the people there were coming from a very different kind of background, maybe more like what my mother's childhood had been like, um, but not what my childhood was like. So I had kind of one foot in and one foot out of a set of institutions that really represent in lots of ways, like our dominant culture um, and I had many very good experiences at those institutions, but I was never like a, a complete insider. 
there. And I think that's a very interesting position to be in. And, and you know, I, I think of it as like, as a superpower in a sort, right? Is, is, is it anything, anything where you are kind of one foot in and one foot out of whatever it is, right? Where you can be the observer um, and maybe the questioner, um, but also a participant gives you a really interesting place from which to write about whatever it is. And so for me, uh, that was these kind of educational institutions um, and, and uh, and we were liars, it just gets transposed into, um, you know, an elite family uh, in, in their private island. But, uh, you know, with with genuine fraud, it's it's Vassar and it's, um, you know, the kind of families who sort of automatically send their kids to Vassar, even if they're not that great students. And it's a, like a very good uh, college um, by, you know, a certain kind of measuring of colleges that you may or may not want to buy into. But, um, so I was writing about, in, you know, that people, uh, there's very often a character in my books who has that kind of position, right? One foot in and one foot out. And we were liars at SCAT in Disreputable History of Frankie Leonard Banks. It's Frankie. Um, in Genuine Fraud, it's um, it's Jewel. And, um, you know, she she gets a foot in. She wedges the foot in. She's not, she's not handed that situation, which is what I was. But she wedges that one foot in. Um, but she can't, she can't get the other foot in, right? And, and. Uh, it's it's complicated, and now I don't remember what we were talking about. <laughs> you were talking about your. I mean, I think you covered it. We were talking about your origin stories and like. Yeah. Every, every writer I've met, you know, just has different levels of how much they feel like they put, how much they borrow from others or um, other stories or their own to inform their work. Um, and so I think what we were getting at was um, your writer's journey and, and your, your story. Um, I mean, do I know anybody like the Jewel? No, <laughs> I made her not. up, right? Um, she's I, like I certainly a part of my soul put on the paper. That's what she is, right? She's me. Mm -hmm. It's just not a pretty part of me. Yeah. No one wants to be the um, villain of their own, of their own life. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to mention again, again, because it's possibly my favorite of your, of oh, your you. published last year. Um, just the way that was written was so interesting. The interiority, the, you know, you, um, we've mentioned a couple movies here today, you know, um, Sliding Doors from that Gwyneth Paltrow movie. That to me, you know, came to me as I was reading it. That, of course, that book also takes place at a, a private boarding school but it, it's not the crux of it it's a it's a family story and it's a self-discovery story and um the kind of uses the whole um it's the motif of of taking a moment and how would it maybe you can show, how it would it work uh there's a million different ways any one moment in somebody's life could go, right? There's a million different paths. It could go veer off and the, the main character is kind of internalizing the different ways her summer could play out. And you as the reader are following her on every single one of those journeys in a way. Um, so another awesome exploration of that life did you want to remark on, on what I just said maybe you can uh, well it's a love story in multiple universes is the simple way to say it um and a family drama um and you know some of the great I mean there's been a lot of really great multi-universe stories on tv lately you know Russian Doll and Loki and Ordinary Joe uh and uh not in Ordinary Joe but in Loki and and Russian Doll, which I, and also in The Good Place, the characters know that there's multiple universes going on. Um, I mean, in The Good Place, they don't know when they're in the middle of it, but they keep figuring it out. Um, and so that is a genre of, of multi-universe story that I dearly love, but it is not what I wrote. I wrote, you know, just that philosophical con construct that you're, that you know, when you make a decision, the universe splits into, you know, this decision and that decision and the other decision. And 
you know, you're set off on different paths and the other people around you are going to have different paths as well because of those choices that you made. Um, but you only get to consciously experience one of them, most possible universes. Um, but all those possible universes are coexisting and multiplying endlessly. Um, so I wanted to write about people falling in love or specifically a teenage girl named Adelaide falling in love when she is having a really hard time in her family and um, trying to figure herself out, um, but to show that how that might happen in multiple universes. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, um, I, was, I was influenced by a play called Constellations, which is a very beautiful play. And right now I'm spacing out on the name of the author, but um, I read that play several times and it's basically about the story of a marriage told in multiple universes. And it's oh. very beautiful and very sad. We'll have to, well, the, um, there are parts to again and again, but it does a redeeming, very nice ending. And um, you were talking about in the beginning about showing off or whatever uh though i don't think it or the liking to show off or whatever i don't we, me as the reader we don't read it that way but i think that um all this to say is that you definitely flex your your muscle in that one with um it was beautiful <laughs> um we're gonna get to some audience questions in just a moment but um do you have any words you know it's october now we're gearing up from NaNoWriMo um in november i'm sure there are a lot of teens watching that love to write um some librarians that are maybe hoping to get on the NaNoWriMo Rhino, Rhino bandwagon any exercises you recommend any advice especially character development uh, maybe you have well, the worst thing is just to sit down and not know what you're supposed to write next right so i would say at the end of a writing day make some notes about what you're going to do next what do you think happens next right maybe it's, you'll have an idea for further later down the story maybe you'll have an idea for the exa exact next sequence but if you give yourself like a little plan you will sit down and begin to execute your plan and it will not be so bad. Second, you don't have to write in order. You don't have to write in order. Probably if you're writing your first or your second or even your third novel, the story will basically happen in order with maybe a couple flashbacks, right? Um, but you don't have to write it that way. You can jump ahead and write the scene that, you know, that love scene that you're dying to write. You can jump ahead and write the hoverboard chase that you're dying to write. You can write as I often do, people sitting around eating English muffins and talking crap about nothing much because you don't really know what happens next. And I do that a lot. And some of it I have to cut out of the book. And sometimes I have to move it around and figure out why they would be talking about these English muffins or whatever else they're talking about. But, you know, when we were liars, there's whole long sections where the liars just sit on the roof of the building and drink lemonade and eat stolen cheese and, you know, talk about stuff. And those are sections that I mostly wrote when I didn't know what else to write or I couldn't get the, the plot to move forward. I would just like write a conversation. And those are some of the most richly thematic parts of the story. And they're also where you really see their relationships build um and you really get to know those characters and so they're not worthless parts of the novel even though they don't move the story ahead in that aggressive way so you know if there's something that you write easily and happily write that on your tough days instead of awesome. none. great advice great advice and that kind of um the first audience question i have here is about um what you're working on next so you're like you just meant what are you going to write next what are you writing oh. next I am writing some, well, I know, I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> it's getting announced in November and people, I think will be very happy about it. Okay, well then why can we uh, pause a moment? Um, we kind of glazed over your uh, graphic novel whistle um, and another awesome cool girl character um, who can speak to who can communicate with dogs. Um, I can't leave that alone, right? She does that in again, again as well. Right, right, right. Um, dogs have come up a lot. Um, well, not a lot. I guess those are the two. Anyway. No, also in Ruby Oliver. Yes, yes, yes. So we'll, we'll, we'll get back to the dogs, but um, let's talk a little bit about Whistle. Whistle is a teenage Jewish activist who gets superpowers and fights Batman villains. It is just a big ball of fun, I think. 
it is and i'm not i'm not a graphic novel i'm not i'm not a comic person normal uh, marvel that whole thing um but i really got into this so <laughs> um i am looking forward to the and you were just one of the questions we have here is about uh, New York Comic Con. You were just there. How was that um, experience? Having it having been not, you know, the whole pandemic and not being around uh, for a bit. It was very overstimulating. Um, you know, I am I am a person who, after a day at you know Y'all Fest or uh, Rochester Teen Book Festival or any one of those wonderful Teen Book Festivals, I have to go like lie down in a dark room and do some deep breathing and then, you know, maybe have a glass of wine. Um, so I get very drained. And this was like that times 10 because I wasn't used to it. And also because everyone was like wearing superhero costumes and manga costumes and anime costumes and video game costumes. And so, you know, you just like sit down to take a breather and like Baymax is there and Pikachu is there and, 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 and Spider-Man and, you know, it's exciting. Um, and yeah. a lot of characters that I didn't know, the anime characters, because I haven't really watched that much anime. Um, and all those people are like, you know, volume readers and super enthusiastic. And I just love this like world of like, you know, let your flag fly, whatever color it is, be like whatever outlandish character you want to be you know, huge grown men with little like pigtails and baby doll outfits and, you know, cross dressing and, uh, you know, the embrace of the cosplay and the excitement over stories and storytelling, all of that was very infectious. Um, and it was really nice to be live in person. I, my panels, I did two panels with um, Cami Garcia, who does um, Raven and Beast Boy comics and as a YA novelist with Shannon Hale, um, you know, Newberry honoree amazingness, uh, Shannon Hale and her new book, which is Friends Forever and her Friends uh, series with um, Lee Wen Pham and, and Pham was there as well. Um, and um, it was just, I knew those creators from before and it was so nice also just selfishly to like get to talk to them and you know, talk afterwards and go and eat some French fries and like watch the scene with some fellow writers, you know, so it, it was really nice. Mostly it was librarians. That was my my crowd at Comic-Con. Um, I had, That's, you know, who came to my signings and stuff. There's always a nice to be surrounded by librarians. Yeah, for sure. I deserve a shout. Um, yeah, after almost two years of the isolation that was that is the pandemic being in an, an atmosphere like that was both thrilling and maybe a little uh exhausting or or confusing or, or something did the pandemic affect how you wrote I mean like did you write more than you ever had or um I did write a lot and I wrote I wrote a book on spec I wrote a book and a half on spec which I have not done in a very very long time um, by which I mean that normally I sell a book on a proposal. So I'll write a proposal, maybe two pages, maybe 10 pages saying what my book is going to be. Then the publisher buys it. Then I think, oh my God, what did I do? You know, especially with genuine fraud. I was like, I basically said I could do something that I had no idea how to do, right? Which is write this backwards book. Um, and so, Normally I do that, but in this case, I sat down and I wrote um, a lot of things just because I wanted to be writing and I didn't think publishers were going to buy anything at the present moment. And I wasn't sure that what I was making would really have a market. Um, and so that was a new experience for me. It was nice to have a job that was immersive and creative. I felt lucky in that respect. Well, and we were lucky to have you here today. Um, one last question before we um, exit out and um, hang around until 7 p.m. when we get to see you again. Um, are you a cat person or a dog person or both? Um, because dogs show up so much in your work. Um, we're cat people here at Baker and Taylor, but we, we love dogs too. I'm just 
You have cat mascots, right? We do, Baker and Taylor. Um, huh. I have been photographed with those guys. Yes, you have. You have. <laughs> um, uh, I know I'm, I am like a cat. I live with cats. I, okay. I, I live with two cats. There's one behind me, but I can't see my own self view. So I don't, uh, in the yellow see chair. Them on the chair. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I write about dogs. I think the dogs in my books are me. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I, funny. I think that they really are just, there's a side of me that is a bouncy, you know, like I pretty much wake up in the morning and I'm like, hello day. It's a good day. Like, this is a lovely just blessing of my brain chemistry or whatever, like, but that's kind of how I roll. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's who the dogs are. It's that side of me that, that like the side of me that is, is really good at just being like, this is a good day. You are some awesome people. I think I am awesome. Let's have fun. Awesome. Well, this was surely a lot of fun. And what is your cat's name? That is Clementine, but she goes by Tiny because she's still only about seven pounds, even though she's. Aww, yeah. what a life! Just hanging out with you, Lockhart, while she writes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and we were lucky to have you today. Um, and I'm gonna just share the link here for our seven. Um, that is my daughter. She's ready for. for <laughs> um, you want to say hi to E. Lockhart and all the the librarians and teens viewing in? Baby girl, sorry. No, go for it. Future fan here, future fan. Oh, wow, you are a lucky person. <laughs> Bye, baby. That's a really, really good, really <laughs> awesome writer. So I'm coming back at seven, which will be live, right? Yes. We'll be live at seven, and yep. I can take actual questions in the comments at seven, and yep. I'll read a different section at seven. So if you have the urge to come back or if you have library patrons who are coming back in at seven, um, we will try to mix it up and still talk about genuine fraud, but talk about different stuff, so. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you again so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Over everyone. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. -bye. <sighs> Oops. On. What just happened? <laughs>